Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today is October 22nd, and today we're going to look at Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so every day. So let's look now at Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. And Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 says this, And these words that I commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Well, this is our reading today from Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. Now, one of the greatest challenges facing the church today is how to get the word into the hearts and the minds of the people of God. Now, we know that people forget most of what they hear in a sermon. They receive so much more information, ideas packaged in in even a very attractive and impacting ways from the world around them. Do we have any hope of success in getting people to grasp and digest the truths of the word? Well, our text today uh, meets us right where we are to help us with this challenge. Now, in verse 6 of our chapter, Moses presents what one's relationship with the Word should be when he says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. The word translated heart refers to what we would call the mind, the organ of the will, where decisions and choices are made. This verse is saying that the person's thinking and behavior is markedly affected by the word. We are calling this the internalizing of the word. John Wesley liked to call Methodists Bible Christians. This is what Moses wanted the Israelites to be. David said this in Psalm 119.11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In the previous episode yesterday, we saw how a person can be oriented in a direction that makes it possible for the Word to do its work. This orientation comes when we fear and even love the Lord. That gives us the gut feelings that motivate us to respond to the truths that we learned from the Word. We saw that getting people to obey the Word is a huge challenge today. For this, the Word must go into the heart. And now verse 7 says, You shall teach them diligently to your children. Now, teach them diligently is a translation of a single word that means repeat. And this is reflected in in the rendering, repeat them again and again to your children in the New Living Translation. The truths of God's word might not go into the mind and transform our lives after one hearing. Therefore, they need to be repeated often, and the primary place where this takes place is in the lives of children in the home. The advertising industry has understood the importance of repetition in helping children to acquire truth. Raymond McHenry reports that researchers in San Diego monitored 95 hours of weekday afternoon and Sunday morning television shows targeted at children. The two-month study revealed children are exposed to 21 commercials an hour. This is a case of persistent and repetitive instruction. Now, according to the Word of God, teaching is not solely a mother's task. Proverbs often speaks of the value of a father's instruction in Proverbs 1.8, in Proverbs 4.1, in Proverbs 6.20, in Proverbs 13.1, and finally, Proverbs 15.5. Proverbs 1.8 says this, Hear, my son, your father's instructions, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Now, considering that this follows the pattern of Hebrew poetry, we need to be very careful about making too much of the difference between a quote-unquote father's instruction and a mother's teaching. But the word translated instruction often takes the meaning of correction, chastisement, or even discipline. It is used in connection with the type of teaching found in the wisdom literature like Proverbs. And so the word translated teaching is Torah, literally direction, which is used for the law. 
Possibly the mother did the, the more systematic teaching that takes place in a routine manner, while the father's instruction focused more on the application of biblical truth to situations in the lives of the children, including their disciplining. Both father and mother should be involved in the teaching of the children. The teaching is to be done diligently, which again has the idea of repeating. This is not an occasional thing that parents do. It is a regular part of the life of the family. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And now, the teaching function should be extended to the church too, especially in places where most of the members have not had the privilege of growing up in Christian homes. The church provides spiritual parents to those who don't have earthly parents to perform that task. This can be done through Sunday school, church Bible studies, and Sunday worship. Now, second, Deuteronomy 6-7 says that the scriptures should be the constant topic of conversation among the faithful in their day-to-day -day lives when it says, You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. The picture we have is of constant input into the lives of children. Now, different aspects of family life are included. They are to talk about the word when they sit in their house. Meal time in the home is an ideal time for such conversations. Similarly, having meals with our spiritual children can provide us with a wonderful opportunity to communicate the truth of God to them. In the Gospels, especially Luke and Acts, a very important place is given to meals, and some of Jesus' teaching took place during these meal times. Meal times usually have an atmosphere of informality and warmth that is well suited to foster discussion. Now, in many cultures today, walking by the way would need to be substituted by driving in the family vehicle. This is a wonderful time for good conversation when there's no TV, although we now have TVs in our cars or SUVs or uh, minivans or whatever. No phone calls. Uh, you know, we still have the internet with smartphones and all those things. But this principle, though, can be extended to our ministry with those that we disciple. Paul virtually conducted traveling Bible school with his many traveling companions whom he mentored. They are then told to talk about the law when you lie down and when you rise. They are to think about God at the start and at the end of the day. That will help us to be godly all throughout the day. By doing so, we affirm that all of life is under God's lordship and that God is with us. Therefore, we do not need to fear because God will look after us. That is to say, we often disobey because we lose our trust in God to see us through the situations of our lives. The messages of this world overcome the influence of the word of God in our lives. The best way to counteract this is to be constantly be exposed to the word of God. And in the Old Testament times, when the people were not bombarded through the media by as many unbiblical messages and narratives as we are today, so much more time was spent discussing the Word of God than today. And considering the volume and the content of what we are exposed to these days, we should be spending more time than the people in the Old Testament times counteracting the anti-Christian messages that we encounter. Clearly, this is an area where we as Christians need urgent attention. So the word is to be top, the topic of discussion in ordinary conversation. This can happen in different ways. Today, we do a lot of sharing of testimonies and conversation, which is indeed a good thing. But so is what I might call word-directed testimony. When we talk about what we are learning from the Word of God, then we can discuss passages that we find difficult to understand. We can discuss difficult issues that we're facing and what, see what the Word of God says about them. And when we see a movie or a program on TV or an advertisement or we're listening to a teaching on a podcast or YouTube, we can evaluate it using uh, criteria from the Word of God as our standard. And because we seek to be word directed in everything that we do, we discuss what the word has to say about every situation that we face. Sadly, in today's world, family discussion has gone out of vogue. Writing in 1970 in an article titled The High Price of TV, Joseph Bailey quotes Dr. Graham Blaine, the chief psychiatrist in the student health services at Harvard University, as saying, The most serious problem of TV is not poor programming, but that it has destroyed the average family's exchange of views and information at the evening meal. People are anxious to get to their favorite program, he says, and so they hurry to finish eating. 
Now she concludes, Bailey, I should say this, Bailey concludes saying, what happened during the day, the little things and the bigger matters are never discussed. There is great joy that just comes from just chatting about the things of God with those who love Christ. In fact, the small group Bible study combines both the teaching and the discussing aspects of handling the Word of God. It is one of the most important means to foster spiritual growth. Here, people are not only confronted with the Word, but are also forced to apply it to their lives at at home, at school, at work, on the playground, and in the neighborhood. The small group a Bible study gives the participants an opportunity to see how the belief that the Word is authoritative for daily life works itself out in practice. They see how the Bible speaks to daily life, and they become skilled in looking at everything they face in life from the perspective of what Scripture says and what Scripture means. They develop what Harry Blairms called the Christian mind. And so we must restore the small group Bible study in the life of the church. There is a fresh emphasis on small groups today in the church, especially in the fall at most every Bible-believing church. People often call them by different names, cell groups, house churches, house fellowships, house groups, G12 groups, living unit groups, class meetings, etc., However, in many groups today, insufficient time is given for Bible study. Usually there is a time of music-oriented praise, a time for sharing testimonies, a time for presenting and praying for needs, and a small devotional to round off the meeting. The participants do not really get an opportunity to grapple with the Word of God. Now, Deuteronomy 6, 8 through 9, it presents creative uses of symbolic visual aids to communicate the word to help people to be constantly aware of it as these ways involve the senses. I'm describing it as a sensual communication. So first, Moses talks about armbands and headbands. He says this in Deuteronomy 6, 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Then he talks about inscriptions at the entrance to the house and the property in Deuteronomy 6, 9, which says, You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now there's some question among scholars as to whether these verses were intended to be followed literally or metaphorically. I believe that they were to be used literally because this type of thing was regularly practiced in the ancient Near East at that time. Israel's neighbors used it in a superstitious way, just like people use good luck charms and talisman today. But in the Bible, it is used as a reminder of covenant identity and the covenant responsibility to obey the word of God. And it's interesting how the Bible invests holy meanings to practices that pagans use for their religious rituals and redeems them for God's glory. Today, we are sometimes afraid to do this because of the pagan connotations attached to these practices. Now, we must be careful when we venture into these areas, but in the word of God, there is such a passion to communicate God's truth that whatever means is able to break through to people's hearts is used so long as it does not harm the receiver of the message. After all, artists use their God-given abilities to express themselves. Sometimes pagan artists produce beautiful art that sadly communicates a wrong message. We can use the same art form, which is familiar to the people to communicate the Christian gospel. A passion to communicate God's truth should cause us to use our creativity in finding the best ways to communicate the gospel message. Moses lived, though, in a preliterate society in which people did not read much. At that time, sensual ways of communication, that is, those that used the five senses, sight, smell, sound, touch, and taste, came to the fore. Today, many societies can be called post-literate as people are reading less and less. And so we too may need to make a fresh effort to look for ways that use the five senses as in the Old Testament times. Sensual ways of communication were very important in Old Testament religion. Here are some examples. First, incense, which was seen as bringing joy in everyday life in biblical times, like in Proverbs 27, 9, was used in the temple partly perhaps to counteract the smell from the animal sacrifices, but mainly because Orientals loved sweet odors. They gave a sweet-smelling pleasantness to worship. Incense is also symbolized the ascending prayers of God's people in Psalm 141, 2 and Revelation 8, 3 through 5. Second, 
festival meals were fashioned so as to communicate specific truths, and certain things were eaten simply because of their symbolic value. Bitter herbs were eaten during the Passover to symbolize the bitterness of the slavery from which the people were delivered. Unleavened bread, which was bread prepared in haste, was also eaten at the Passover to remind the people of their hurried exit from Egypt and also of the pilgrim character of their lives in Exodus 12.11, Exodus 12.20, Exodus 12.34, and Exodus 12.39. Now next, the festivals which played an important part in Jewish life were educational events. As A.W. Morton explains, through participation in the festivals, the children would learn their meaning, and in this way the festivals became a part of life indelibly etched upon their minds. The festivals were unique opportunities for teaching the young people the great truths of the Jewish faith. They provided a dramatic, vivid, intrinsically interesting way of teaching. Next, we know that the prophets acted out their message so that it would make a graphic impact on the people. This was particularly seen in the acted parables of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. God asked Jeremiah to buy a linen waist cloth and cause it to be spoiled even before its first wash to show how the Lord would spoil the pride of Judah in Jeremiah 13. Different musical instruments next communicated different messages to the people. The trumpet, for example, was sometimes used in music, but more often it was used to proclaim a message through its loudness. It was used as a summons to battle in Jeremiah 4.19 to proclaim victory in battle in 1 Samuel 13.3. And in the context of worship, trumpets, along with cymbals, were used to accompany exuberant praise in 1 Chronicles 15.28. We need to be clear, though. Biblical truth is always to be primary in our lives as Christians. What we want is to get the unchanging message out to people as revealed in the Word. Sometimes people get so engrossed in the art form that the message gets neglected, and all the time is spent performing the art form without much interest in getting the Word across to people's hearts. Now, there have been abuses of the symbolic in history. The Protestant Reformation was a reaction to these abuses. The symbols assumed a magical quality, and people began to give uh, to the symbol the place that should go to what the symbol symbolized. That happens when religiosity takes the place of a living faith. Deuteronomy 6 presents a corrective to this call in verse 5 to love the Lord with our whole being. If that love is there, the symbols will certainly serve as aids to devotion. Without it, they will become objects of devotion. Adam Clark, writing about 200 years ago, saw this as an example of God's accommodation to human weakness when he wrote, God, who knows how slow of heart we are to understand, graciously orders us to make use of every help and through the means of, of things sensible or sensual to rise to things spiritual. That is to say, we are to use creativity in helping people remember biblical truth. We need to keep that in mind, that visual creative means of communicating truth, they leave one with a much greater likelihood of internalizing the truth and remembering it. We do this a lot with children, but we seem to think that adults do not need such things. Perhaps this is indicative of the overly rational orientation that Protestantism developed over the centuries. Now, the Protestant church still has several symbolic items in its life that have been derived directly from the Word of God, like the Lord's Supper and baptism. To these, we could add symbolic items that help us to remember the Word of God and to internalize it, not to take people away from the Word of God, but to help them internalize it to remember what Scripture is saying. One example of this is banners in church buildings. They can be used to help highlight important truths. When Dr. Kent Hughes preached through a book at College Church in Wheaton, Illinois, a banner hung in the sanctuary that represented the message of the book. Those banners provided the covers for many of the books of the Preaching the Word series. So friends, we need to remember the Word of God. We need to take time to be intentional and purposeful in our not only reading it, but our internalizing its message. Now, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is October 22nd, and we've looked at Deuteronomy 6, 6-9. through Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. 
Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.